Welcome to the lecture on rasters. We'll look at the, the actual structure of a, a raster, how they're built up, uh, a little bit of how they're used. We'll look at a little bit of uh, how we can um, work with them, the sort of um, the functions we like to use when working with rasters, but more detail on that will come in a later lecture. On, on, on let's start again. <coughs> So welcome to the lecture on rasters. This will be um, a quick look at how they are made up, how we construct them, how they are stored, and how we can work with them in, in some way. We'll go into more details later on in other lectures uh, in more case-specific uh, uses of rasters. But now this is um, a basic look at them. We've already been introduced to rasters in a previous lecture, uh, so let's just look at a few more details. This is what we mean by a raster. This is one type of raster, at least. This is an aerial photograph, and we can see that we have um, various colors uh, continually varying across the image. Uh, it looks like continuous data, which is uh, what we say that rasters are good for, storing continuous data. Um, there are, in this image, that we can see at least three different bands of color, red, green, and blue stored in three different layers, and the combination of those in each pixel creates a, a, a specific colour. Uh, and these vary, as I said, continuously across the image, except that when we zoom in, we can see that each pixel in this image, as this is an image, we will call them pixels. If it was other type of information, for example, elevation, we might call them cells instead. But in each pixel here, we can see that the it's made up of many different squares of an homogeneous colour. So the colour within the square does not vary, um, so it is discrete, because computers store data discreetly. But when we zoom out far enough, we don't see this problem. We don't see that it is actually stored as discrete packages of data. It looks continuous. As far as we are concerned, this is continuous data, and we will treat it as continuous data, for the most part. So this is our continuous data. This is a, a, an aerial photograph, as I said, um, in a raster structure with information in every single square. There are no places within the image where there isn't data. We have had to store data on the color values for in each individual pixel. And that is another point to make with raster data. There are no empty spaces. We have to provide information about every single square. And so we end up with so if we zoom out far enough, step back far enough, it becomes, again, we start to, to, to lose this squarey kind of feel to it, this pixelated feel, and we, we start to see our image again of a trampoline in this central portion. So how are these built up then? Let's just go through some concepts and some constraints that we have. So uh, the raster will consist of pixels or cells, as I said, uh, we use the, the terms interchangeably, but generally speaking, pixels for images and cells for other types of data. Uh, and they're stored in uh, rows and columns. Uh, we have rows and columns here in our image, uh, in, in this figure here. And we must describe the data. We must describe the number of rows and the number of columns. So why do we need to store the number of rows and number of columns? Well, one of the main characteristics of a raster is that we don't have to uh, explicitly store the information about each individual location. We just store a string of data and then we chop it up uh, according to the number of rows and the number of columns that there are. So we don't need to be storing too much positional information, just the characteristics that exist at each point. And then the position of that data is implicit in its position in the chain of information flowing in, so to speak. But further to that, we also need to know how big our pixels are. What area of ground are they covering, if it's the ground we're talking about? So we need to know, in both X and Y, commonly in a projected coordinate system, we are looking at pixels that are of uh, equal size in both the X and the Y, but that, not, that isn't necessarily the case. They may be uh, oblong in some way. Uh, we also want to understand what coordinate system we are in. Uh, for at least one part, one corner usually, uh, and then a rotation around that so that we know how to orient the grid of data we have here. Where is it on the Earth and what way do we 
twist it and place it out. Of course, we can get the rotation by having more than one coordinate. We could have two, three, four coordinates, uh, the all four corners. That would tell us where our image should lie on the Earth. But we also need, of course, the coordinate system. We need to know what coordinate system is being used. And then, obviously, every other necessary metadata required. Never forget the metadata. Who created this file? What data does it contain? And so on and so forth. So that's a row going there, just in case you were wondering, and that's a column going down there. Now this is a, something that we should uh, try to remember. Uh, as obvious as it may seem, we have this slight conflict uh, in GIS because we're working with uh, computers using data that is essentially mathematical, but we are using coordinate systems that are flipped in relation to what computers and, and maths uh, likes. So we start counting in, in our coordinate systems, our spatial coordinate systems, we start counting down here uh, in the bottom left hand corner and going along this this axis here, which we're going to here call x, uh, that's fine, we go along there and in our, our geospatial uh, and, um, coordinate systems we count upwards. But a computer uh, um, will store data from this corner here. So we increase towards the right as normal, but they go downwards. Uh, and that's fun. Uh, that's something that we have to be aware of. The computer is generally speaking in most cases going to take care of this for you. There are a couple of exceptions that we may come around to uh, in later lectures. But just be aware of that, that the, the images that you see on the screen, that as the computer has stored them, uh, it starts at the top here and works its way downwards rather than in the geographic sense of starting from down here and working upwards. So how do we uh, um, then move on to placing our data into a coordinate system accurately? We said we have to give the, 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 the resolution, that the, the amount of ground that a pixel is covering. We have to have this x and the y, and we have to define our position on the, uh, of the corners somehow. Uh, for our, our grid, but we also have this, this rotation as well, perhaps. It may be that our data is aligned uh, with the coordinate system. It may not be. Um, this is just uh, something that we have to deal with. We might want to align it uh, um, with the coordinate system, which will involve something called resampling, uh, which we will come to in a later lecture, uh, where we then uh, rotate our grid. But that means moving the data a little bit which can be problematic. Uh, we, we, we will come to that point later on. It's not without uh, uh, error. Uh, we can try to minimize the errors, but uh, it, it, it may be that we introduce some errors in there when we do this. But we have our raster there that is in a coordinate system. It's defined well in space uh, with, it, with its position and size. So just a quick illustration of what we're talking about. Let's just go over this basically this whole thing again in a different illustration. I said that we were storing data as one long string uh, of information. We've got a, a series of numbers and that's what's being stored uh, in the computer. There's no positional information on any of these, it's just being stored there as, as a series um, a sequence of digits. Maybe it's uh, floating point numbers, maybe it's integers, it doesn't matter. Uh, whatever it is, it's just this series of numbers. Um, that is supposed to represent something. Whether it's discrete or continuous data, it doesn't matter in this case, but it's stored in the, in the computer looking like this. We also have other information at the side uh, that, that can be applied to the image as a whole. The number of columns, the number of rows, their pixel size and their orientation and where in the world they are. And so we take this information, we take the, the number of columns and we say, well, there are four columns in our image and there are four rows. So we can take that stream of data and after four pieces we hack it off and then create a row with that. And then in the next four we hack off and create another row. And that has created the basic image. We've now got something that looks like our, our raster. This happens to be a perfectly square raster, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, and then we need to determine the size of each pixel. How big an area do they cover on the ground? So we can define the, the, each pixel as being half a meter big or two meters big. 
It has no inherent size in itself, it's just a piece of data on the computer, so we define that as being something. And then we have this thing with the, the, the orientation, rotation of this pixel. Which way do we want to turn it? And then we need to place it into our coordinate system somewhere. Put it into, into a coordinate, lay, lay it onto our map of the Earth. And so now we've stored the data, we've taken it out, we've turned it into a raster, and we've placed it onto the Earth uh, in, a, in, a, in a good representation of, of, of where it should be. So that was our, uh, the basics of the raster itself. The data that it stores, as we've spoken about previously, can be uh, continuous or discrete data. And we've also said several times now that uh, raster is good for continuous data, not so good for discrete data. Vector is good for discrete data, not so good for continuous. So let's try and exemplify this, uh, see if we can um, work out what's going on. So on, on the left, we have some continuous data, not very inventive continuous data, but it's supposed to represent continuous data. And on the right, we have some discrete data. So uh, we have the same value here, it's discrete packages of data in these areas. All of these are ones, all of these are twos, whatever this represents. Uh, so this could be urban, this could be a lake, this could be forest, some, what, whatever it is, um, it's, it's just some discrete packages of data. Uh, and here they are stored both as rasters. So as you can see, this uh, information here, we can't easily compartmentalize any further because all of this surface is one, all of this surface is two, all of this surface is 22, all of this surface is 32, all of this is 33, and so on. So that's about as small as we can get it. Here, we can see that, well, we've got lots of ones. There's one and a 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 one. And a one. It's quite repetitive. It's homogenous across this whole area. So what, what does this mean? Well, if we look at this as vectors instead, if we were to try and convert this continuous data into some form of vector, we would have to identify the point. We would then need to give a coordinate for this point here. Uh, and, and now we're just talking about the point. We've not, we've not described how big it is, the fact that this has to have some form of extension in, in two dimensions. Uh, so this is, this is not even this is accurate. Uh, but we have a position, we have a, sorry, we have a descriptor of which point we're talking about. We have its location in X and in Y, and then we have the value that we want to put there. And then we need another row of data for the next point, and we need to describe this with its point number, its value in X, its value in, or its location in X, its location in Y, and its value in, in Z. So, and then so on and so forth. And as I said, I've, in this very simple illustration, I've, I've not even included the fact that we need to describe the outer boundaries of this. We are saying this is a con continuous surface covering everything here, and our description is actually only exists at each point, and then we're assuming somehow, somewhere, uh, undescribed in my pathetic attempt at a, a vector here, the, to, to, to make this continuous. So we can see that this is going to require a lot of information, much more than that simple stream of data that we had before. And in fact, to describe this, we have 64 rows of the 64 pixels here, uh, and so we've got 64 rows of data, and if I just make a very approximate calculation for this, it depends on how big the numbers are and so on, we're looking at 14,336 bits to store, uh, this is very approximate, to, to, to store this just, just as it is now. Right, that, that's, uh, uh, that's information more than perhaps you care to know about, but there it is. We can use these numbers to compare uh, the methods within a minute. So when we go to the... Uh, so the discrete case, we uh, instead of just having pixel by pixel, we can describe the data. When we look at this, when we turn this into a, into a vector, obviously we could have just done the same thing, point by point by point. That would have been exactly the same. We'd have ended up with this huge amount of uh, huge. I mean this this, this number of uh, bits here. But if we instead say, well, I can see that this is one package here. This is one homogeneous. Uh, discrete package of data, a polygon that goes from there to there, or has this particular form. So we can define a point there, we can define a point there, a point there, and a point there if we like. We could even go via that point, and then we join those together, either by joining them together as lines first, or by defining a polygon directly from these points. And then we can do the same thing for here, and we can do the same thing for here, and the same thing for here. So we, we store the information about the points, and then we bind those points together into our polygons, 
and say that everything within that polygon has, is a value one, say, or a value two. So here we've, we're defining these points, we're given the locations for, uh, for the discrete locations of these eight points or in our map. Now that takes up a certain amount of data, obviously, and then we need to inform the computer um, about the fact that you can bind some of these points together to make a polygon. So we're saying take point one, point two, point seven, and point five. So we've gone from point one to point two to point seven to point five, and that's a polygon. They define these four points define uh, the, the outer boundaries of the point. So join them together in a, in a line, and whatever's within that line is our polygon, and everything in there is a value one, whatever one means. And so we do that for each individual surface that we, we are defining here. And if we do the same sort of calculation, very approximate again, we can see that to define this entire area, it's used far fewer bits. So it's a much more efficient way of saving uh, data, of storing data when we have this discrete form to it. This is much better than trying to do this sort of thing where we save it pixel by pixel by pixel. That's not very efficient. On the other hand, if, if we were to try and save uh, this continuous data as, as, as a vector, you can see that it, it, it expands very rapidly. Now, anybody doing their calculations on this who wants to play around with the numbers might come across a little bit of a problem here because my examples are quite small, fit them on the screen and actually make sense of them. And if we look at this sort of eight by eight structure, well, actually, um, <clears throat> it doesn't really matter uh, we could we could store it as a as a vector in this very small format. We could store it, and it would still be quite small. Um, but as uh, only five hundred and twelve bits. But uh, as um, as we expand uh, and, and make this uh, and, and increase the the, the density of, uh, of cells or pixels in this, uh, as soon as we get up to say a seventeen by seventeen, uh, we're immediately into a much larger uh, file. So it's. The small scale examples tend, aren't terribly illustrative in that sense, don't worry.